Hello and welcome to this special live stream of event content theory. I'm your host Sal Camardo with Meetapp and for the next 30 minutes we'll be digging deep into the world of virtual event content strategy. Uh, if you've joined our last few live streams, we've been building on top of what we started from our first webinar on how to convert your in-person event to digital. Our first webinar titled Going Virtual was a primer on things to consider when producing a virtual event. Our second demystifying virtual events was part roundtable discussion and part behind the scenes. We invited a few friends from the AV world to take your questions and talk about different technologies and configurations. Now today we're in for a special treat because we've got a special guest all the way from Sweden and we will be diving in head first into how to plan and execute amazing uh, event content specifically for a virtual meeting or conference. So that said, let's welcome our guests. All the way from Stockholm, Sweden, internationally renowned meeting and event expert Tommy Brott from Interactiva Moten. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, he's so popular that when Swedish fish try to think of something Swedish, they say Tommy. And my trusty man at arms, project manager extraordinaire Eric Miller from Mainline AV. Meeting planners say that he's so hot that hot sauce is now considered Eric Miller sauce. Now, don't forget to download today's companion app, Event Concept by Meet App. It's free in either the Apple App Store or in Google Play. No registration required. Just simply download it, enter the event, Event Content Theory. Uh, in there, you can submit any of your questions, answer some live polls, and access all the special content from today's live stream. Now, one of the things that I hear from a lot of people, especially with virtual events, since this is a fairly new thing for a lot of event and meeting professionals, is how do you get started? Um, what are some of the key things that you need to consider when you're, when you're starting to plan your content? Uh, Tommy, uh, I want your input as far as, you know, maybe what you're coaching your customers, customers on, um, or even what you're hearing a lot of from meeting and event professionals especially in, you know, in Sweden or in Europe as a whole. Um, you know, one thing that I kind of feel is that a lot of people have a tendency to, and this is something we talked about before, Eric, you remember, a lot of people have a tendency to think about the technology piece first. Um, and I try to tell them, look, you, you want to think about that last or second, I should say. Um, yeah. Really, you want to focus on what are you building here? Content, you know, what, what are you trying to deliver? Um, can you tell us a little bit about just how you get started? Yeah, yeah. And I think I'm going to say something that everything say that they are doing, but I, when you scratch a little bit on the surface, you find out that that maybe is not the case. Uh, because I think the first and the most important thing is to have a measurable and communicated target for the event. Um, and what do I mean by that? Uh, because if you ask people, they say that they have that. But let's take an example. When I, a lot of years, started in, in this business and I was out for an agency and, and trying to sell the agency, um, then I could meet the client. And, and in some cases, they showed a little interest in, in, in fact, uh, buying something from us. And it could, could uh, sound like, well, we are going to have a sales conference uh, this autumn, a kickoff. And uh, if you would like, you can come back to us with an, an idea on how to, to plan and, and do that uh, kickoff. And in that case, I would be very, very glad and I would run back to my colleagues on the agency and start sketching on the event. Then mm -hmm. I would have um, uh, maybe booked or pre-booked a venue or two. I, we would have find out the concept for the event. Uh, we would uh, maybe have uh, found one or two professional speakers that was very inspirational. And then we would have packed that down and I would have got back to the, uh, the um, possible client mm -hmm. and, and uh, presented our ID. And in, in, in the worst case, they, they have maybe have bought that. Mm -hmm. If I would like to do, if I would do that today, I would have asked more questions. We are saying that we are going to have a sales conference, but what is your your biggest challenges right now around selling? Well, this is just a normal sales conference. We want a, a great start on the autumn. We want people motivated. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but if you 
back down a little bit and uh, think a little bit about what's your biggest challenge challenges around the sales today. So you're saying essentially ask more questions up front, um, you know, focus on, you know, what, 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 what might be the challenges or what are the, th essentially what is the real goal and purpose yeah. of that event? Um, yeah. In the sense that like, for, like you said, with a sales conference, for instance, a lot of people, and I could tell you, I have a lot of clients that do sales conferences and usually it's a very cookie cutter format. Oh, we're going to have, you know, someone that does the kickoff and then someone that goes over some KPIs, so, you know, as far as sales trends and then, you know, some inspirational rah-rah speaker. And then next thing you know, you know, there's cocktail receptions and that's it. Um, what you're saying is basically, let's kind of step it back and take a look at, okay, why are you doing this event? What are some of the challenges? And yeah. then how do we essentially turn those into KPIs that we could measure and yeah. see the success rate? Yeah, within yeah. the event what what must we achieve to be successful okay. and in this case maybe we might want to ask question it could have been uh that they say well when we are thinking about it the biggest challenge right now is that we are lacking of upsell to our existing clients um and if we are penetrating that even more maybe we could uh, could uh, understand that the problem is that they don't yeah, the employees don't call um, their clients on a daily basis. So a measurable target could be that everybody in the firm will call one or one more call every day to an existing client for two months or something like that. And if you have that target, there will be a lot of more questions that will be rung to, to, uh, to the existing clients. And that's great because that will give value back uh, to, to uh, the client in this case. But for me as an event producer, it's two completely different events. In one case, it could be, be the right thing to have the big venue, the great uh, you know, professional speaker and so on and so on. But in the other case, it could be more right to uh, have a speaker that's talking about personal fear or the fear of losing or something like that. It mm -hmm. could also be, be more correct to have not a big venue or the venue should at least have, have a, be able to have 30 breakout rooms where, where the clients can call uh, their first uh, calls and get feedback from a coach. So maybe mm -hmm. you need 30 coaches instead of one big inspirational speaker. So different, completely different events. And it's also very important to communicate that goal to all stakeholders in the event. Great. Now, Tommy, there's this fun acronym I keep hearing about, uh, PIRI. And I know you've mentioned or you've explained this to me before, but I kind of want to explore this a little bit further because I feel like this is something that would be really helpful to a lot of meeting and event professionals. Can you explain PIRI? Yes, I was working at an event agency in Stockholm a couple of years ago, and it was a pretty successful event agency. There's a competition in Sweden uh, where all successful ag agencies take part, and it's called Agency of the Year. And we was in that for a couple of years, and it was like six and seven and so on, so it was good. But it wasn't the winner position that we, of course, wanted to have. Uh, so one weekend we brought all our programs and running orders for all the events we have done the last year. And we started to look through them and sort them into two piles. Um, one of them that we checked was, was this uh, event very successful? Did we reach our goals? Was it a success? Yes. Then we put it in one pile. We checked through the other, did this reach the goals? Maybe not. It wasn't that good. So in the end of the day, we had two piles. Then we started to check through them and see those events that went so good and what successes, what did they include? What did they build on? And those that didn't, what did they lack? And from that, in fact, we, we built a recipe called Piri. Because all the events that had been success, uh, in fact, they had a part of it that was built on provocation. We needed that to get the energy in the event, to get people to get involved, to raise a little bit from their chairs and get involved in the event. 
all the event that was so successful, of course, had a lot of inspiration and a lot more of inspiration than provocation. They also had time for reflection so that people could take the measure and let them sink into their brains and think about what they meant for them in their daily business or in their daily jobs. And all the event that was successful also held a lot of interaction. So we started to mark up all our running orders and, and check that we had those colors. And if we had uh, running orders with a lot of, of colors in it, then we would be rather sure that this would be a good event. And we started to do this on all the events that we did. Uh, and the year after that, we of course were in the competition and we won the competition. And we won the year after that. And the year after that, we was on the second place. So I think this gave us a lot of, of uh, help we, when we was planning the event. And still today, I'm using this as a checklist to see if we are going to make a successful event. So let's talk about the word of the day, because uh, let's face it, since I, I think I've had more people asking me about this since our first webinar, when we kind of, for lack of better terms, introduced the word, even though it's been around for a long time. But this whole concept of dramaturgy, um, Tommy, can you tell me a little bit about, uh, and I know that you're a pro when it comes to dramaturgy and kind of explaining it, and you've actually explained it to a few of my customers in the past. So I want to kind of take it, take it, take it out of the expert's mouth. Can you give us a little bit of, you know, kind of a little definition of, or kind of a walkthrough of dramaturgy? Yes, sir. Let me take an example. Let's say that you are uh, one day at home, it's a Friday and it's payday, you have got, got your paycheck in on your account and you open a paper and in the paper you see that Rolling Stones are going to have a concert, they're starting a new tour and they are, are going to play in, in your town. Um, and you are thinking, maybe this is the last chance to see Rolling Stones, maybe they end after this tour. So you order tickets to it and you order it to your family and even to your neighbors because you owe them something. So, it, so it's time to pay the neighbors back. Uh, so you order this one uh, and, and there is, then when you have ordered that, you have placed that order is going to happen two things in your body. One is very positive and one is not so positive. The positive thing is that you're going to look forward to the concert. Uh, you are going to be very sensible for everything that, that the papers write about uh, Rolling Stones. And it's, it's a good way and a good time to communicate with, with your target audience. The not so good thing is that you're getting a little bit worried. Aren't they a bit too old? Can this really be good? It's going to be rather shameish if, uh, if it's not good. Uh, and Rolling Stones are really pros. So they, they know both the positive feeling that you have in your body and the negative one. So when you and your family and, uh, and your neighbors arrive to the concert and they finally go up on stage, in what energy level do they start the concert? I would say that on a scale from one to 10, they will start at around between seven and nine because they will going to start the concert with, with one of their classical great songs. Not the best one, not the most popular one, but one with a lot of energy. And then their concert will keep on and, and maybe not exactly as this line, but, but energy level and, and how good the songs are popular, how, how famous the songs are, will go a little bit up and down. Uh, but you can be sure that you are not going to be over the energy level that the concert started with. Until it's about half an hour left, then they will deliver a nine, and then a 10, and then another 10, and they probably will get back and, and have an extra number that's 10 and a half on the scale. Because what's happening then is that you are going to, to go out from the concert and you are going to be high on the energy and you're going to tell everybody that you know that you need to buy 
uh, ticket to go to see Rolling Stones because they are still fabulous. Um, and uh, in fact, every movies is built on this dramaturgy. Almost every books, almost every theaters, almost every rock concert is based yeah, some, on, is built on some this sort theater. of cadence, exactly. And now I love using this curb, and and Tommy, this is something that I use with our with my customers here when I try to explain to them, you know, essentially where they're putting their speakers. Because I get a lot of customers that will say, "Well, we need to put our CEO at the beginning and and at the end, you know, to kind of kick it off and close it out." And sometimes their CEOs are just super low energy, so they just suck the energy right out of the room. And I know sometimes it's hard to deal with that because it is the CEO and, you know, sometimes there's an ego at play, but I try to show them this, this line curve to kind of explain to them, look, your CEO is like down here. All right. And energy, you have to start this on a high note and end with a bang. So, you know, how can you talk to me a little bit about just how you kind of approach that conversation, you know, when you're plotting your speakers? I'm very familiar with that problem. Um, what I'm trying to, I'm not always successful, but what I'm trying to do is to very early in the process uh, involve uh, the CEO and give them the, this example. I, I, I tell them about the Rolling Stones example and show this curve. And if I do that early in the process, then it's not seldom that the CEO himself uh, comes with the idea that we maybe should start with a film or something that brings energy and that, that he or she can come in a little bit later. Yeah, and I know that Eric, uh, <laughs> I'm sure you have some input on this because we worked, uh, we worked a couple of projects together where you know, you'll have somebody that's just a low energy speaker. Now, I, I've seen you guys do a few fun things to kind of you know, bring the uh, level up a bit of speakers. Like what, what would you recommend in those situations? Yeah, we, I mean, if we can get a rehearsal with them, that's, that's key. A lot of people are okay to take some direction. They, they like the feedback. Um, and the other things we do are, you know, some, we'll play some walk-up music to get everyone excited. If we had time and there was pre-recorded video content to really get it going, you know, we're going to bring down the lights, play a, now, uh, a nice, loud, booming video to get the crowd going things along those lines. Also, we use polling in, in, in like a meeting app in order to kind of get some interactivity going between the audience and the speaker just to help them feel comfortable. That's excellent. Excellent point because actually that kind of leads into my next question for Tommy because I know that you actually dissect this curve out into four parts and then kind of you know, create those interactions based on those four segments. Uh, yeah. Can you tell me, tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. If I divide the conference in, into different parts, then I, I always ask for the important that the, the target audience understands why. Why is this conference so important? And in this part, I often use interaction and pedagogical uh, in, interaction which where I ask questions that they will by themselves answer with why is it important. Maybe we have an, an input from a, a speaker uh, that give example from, from a, a similar situation but in another business. Um, and then we work with why so people really feel that this is important. I'm lucky that I'm here on this conference. In the next part, we talk about the what. It could be a new strategy and things like that, that will be, be uh, outlined. Uh, and after that, we have the how. How shall we do to, to interpret this, uh, this new strategy? How will we get this into our daily business? And here I also use interaction because the employees or, or the target audience often knows best in what way can we, we start working with this new strategy? And in the last part, I make sure that we are, are bringing that energy, like the Rolling Stones uh, uh, extra numbers that is really, really good, because if we can have that energy uh, in the employees or whatever it is, 
I'm sure that they will will go home and and the day after this start uh, uh, working with the house, so to say. Now we've got a lot of questions that have uh, come through just in the last uh, 15 or so minutes. Um, I want to keep this moving along. So uh, before we take questions, I do have a couple of points that I do want to kind of go over. Um, obviously some things that you want to consider when you're doing your virtual events or when you're producing a virtual event. Um, you know, one thing that I always talk about is the importance of mapping your experience. Because uh, the reality is that, look, you can't, it, there, there's, it's not a one-to-one -one match. It's not like I'm going to be taking my entire, you know, 12 hour a day, three day conference and somehow remap or just map that directly over to a virtual experience. Because the reality is sometimes those things, you know, there are certain elements in person that don't translate well to live. So you also want to take into consideration things like, you know, people's attention spans and where they're at. You know, you can't control those distractions anymore like you used to. So, you know, obviously shortening your program, uh, making sure there's plenty of interactivity, uh, but most importantly, making sure that, you know, you're defining those goals, those measurable targets, and, you know, the, the defining that purpose of that event early on, and then mapping that experience over uh, into something that makes sense for virtual. Um, Eric, do you want to maybe throw in a few kind of things to consider when you're, when you're creating a virtual event? Sure. Yeah. I mean, one of the biggest things that we've been doing a lot now that everyone's completely virtual, um, and it is pre-recording, uh, we can't stress that enough. And it's, it's really good because it enables you to work with your speaker ahead of time. Uh, we can pre-record them remotely. And then you can take that, you know, that same curve that Tommy just showed you and, and lay it over your presentation and say, this is, this is what we need to do, break it down per presentation. And in that pre-recording, we can make sure that you're sticking to time because that's the most valuable thing when people are doing virtual events is keeping it shorter, but boiling down the essence of all your presentations. And then also using a, a conference app because that's a great delivery system for the extra content to go with the presentations. We find that works really well. Well, yeah, I agree because I mean, look, the reality is that, you know, you still need to be able to drive your audience. You still need to be able to deliver all your content. You still need to be able to do a level of interaction and engagement, facilitate networking, all the stuff that, you know, an app does, um, you know, a stream is a stream. A webinar tool is a webinar tool. The app is where is kind of the home of everything. Um, Tommy, do you want to add maybe a few things that uh, you know you want to maybe throw out there to the audience as far as you know, kind of things that you uh, want people to consider when they're producing a virtual event? Yes, I'm thinking a little bit about the interactivity. I'm also using the app, and I, I'm very glad to use it, but. When we are doing interaction during a an, an, uh, digital event, uh, I think it's important that you consider that people often sit by themselves. So if you ask questions, avoid to use a lot of free text questions, mm -hmm. because I think you need a quicker and more energyful uh, interactivity. So I would say prefer uh, word clouds, I would prefer uh, uh, single choice questions and multiple choice questions and not very much uh, long free text questions. Oh, it makes it makes it easier for them to just go ahead and select what they need to select um, or, or just interact without having to think of the dissertation that they're going to be typing out. Um, look, I mean, I, I tell my customers, especially even with like evaluations or surveys, that's something that they want to consider because, you know, if, you, if you're going to make people type, people, people don't have the patience or the attention span to do certain things anymore, especially nowadays, seeing that, you know, everybody's stuck at home, you know, and the TV's on in the background, the kids riding the family dog like a horse, yeah. who knows what's happening in that environment. Um, but yeah, being able to really create those interactions and those small, easy and iterative bursts over time is going to be much more efficient. 
Now, before we jump into today's live Q&A, uh, we did send you all a quick poll and want to know if you're, current, uh, if you're currently planning your event content with Cadence or Dramaturgy in mind. So right now, as far as it looks, I'm actually quite surprised a lot of you already do. We're at about 56% uh, for yes, you do, about 37.5% for no, not at all. And six and a quarter percent for uh, no, but someone else in my organization does. So good for you all. This is fantastic to see that you guys are taking all of these into consideration. For those of you that don't, it looks like we just had an update. Now it looks like we're a neck and neck tie with uh, yes and no, but still a lot better than I thought. So that said, um, we've got a lot of questions that are coming through in the live Q&A. Uh, for the panel. So we're going to try to get the, through as many questions as we can until we're kicked out. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to submit them uh, by going into the dialogue section of the app and select the please submit your questions option. And the first question, uh, do you have any tips on how to push back on a client that insists on having a part of their program that may not translate well to virtual? Uh, let me pass that one off to Eric first. Eric, do you have any... Uh, do you have any recommendations for people that, you know? Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's tough. Um, it, you know, it really comes down to, and, and after, you know, talking with Tommy, boiling down the essence, like, is that presentation really, really helping the overall message of what the event is trying to, to get done? Or can it be maybe recorded? and then posted later for people to see somewhere else. I mean, that that's something that we've done. A lot of people are starting their own libraries for extra content to come back to. Excellent, Tommy, you have any uh, anything you could add to that? Um, I also give them advice to use an event app because then they can have this additional material in the app, like presentations. Uh, maybe you can have, have uh, film clips uh, of, of different uh, things and uh, as have that as an extra layer on the event. Fantastic. Uh, we are <laughs> running the clock down, so I'm gonna try to get through these next few questions as quick as possible. How much time should we add to the planning process when factoring for things like dramaturgy? Tommy. Uh, if the question was about uh, the, the planning process in itself, I wouldn't say that that's very much time that it takes. Uh, but but uh, if you have that perspective with you when you are planning the event, it won't take much more time than, than doing without it. Excellent. Excellent. Eric, yeah. you anything to that? Yeah, I mean, we can piggyback off the fact that, you know, this recording, the beginning half, we actually pre-recorded this. So now we're live, as you can see, by Sal wearing a different shirt. So um, we took some time on Monday and got together and took about, what did we take guys, about three hours? and Not even, about two, about two, three hours, yeah. But right. funny thing you should say that because actually that was the next question. I noticed Sal is wearing a different shirt, wardrobe <laughs> change, or did I miss something? Um, yeah, we actually did pre-record uh, the first half of this. Um, really, and Eric, you want to explain the benefits of that? Yeah, sure. Um, and we had Sal dressed different to see if it was like the little Easter egg to see if anyone noticed. Uh, but yeah, the benefits, like I said earlier in, in the clips are that you can work with your speakers, you can come up with an actual script. Um, in times like this in virtual events, we've even done um, virtual teleprompting where we can lay the script out and the person could be speaking into a camera on their end and actually reading a script. So you have a timed video that will go right into where you need to for your agenda. So it fits, if it's supposed to be 15 minutes, 15 minutes it is. Um, obviously, you know, last night and yesterday, we were doing some editing on this video, but that's all part of the process. Excellent. Uh, we have time for one more. Uh, do, either our, do either of our presenters have resources online that are available, uh, how-to guides, top 10 tips, or a blog? Yes, uh, I think I have been rewriting a lot of the meetup page, but most of it is in Swedish. But I think that some of them are uh, um, translated to English. Yes, actually, we have a lot of resources for live street or for virtual events, for in-person events, uh, top 10 tips, 
uh, full blog, articles, white papers, everything pretty much available at meetappevent.com. Uh, Eric, do you guys have any, you know, I know you have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of tidbits of information on our site that are directly from you guys. So, <laughs> Yeah, we don't, have, we don't have anything specific, unfortunately, up there. But I mean, if people reach out to us, we're more than happy to, to take a call or share with them some ideas. Awesome. Now, I'm going to stretch this out just a little bit longer because I'm not getting kicked out yet. But um, I have one more question, and I want to take this one because this is specifically for kind of nonprofits, cultural institutions. Um, I have somebody asking here, how can these strategies be used for events at cultural institutions like museums, not particularly fundraising events? So I would think that this is a very, I mean, a lot of what you heard today as far as strategy is concerned is uh is really um is is applicable to to any type of event whether it's you know a meeting a conference uh some sort of nonprofit event um if you're not talking like fundraising events for instance where it's more kind of straight social um can you guys elaborate on that absolutely uh i'm working a lot with like governments and departments uh, and, and uh, cities and so on and we are working a lot with with these strategies so i would say it's 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 basically the same uh, but everything is as we talked about in the beginning back to the to the target for the event what's what's the goal the purpose and the target for the event excellent excellent um let's keep going guys uh are you guys okay with time yeah Yes. Yeah. We'll do two. We'll do a couple more. Um, how long does it take to edit pre-record or or edit uh, pre-recorded videos? Eric, that's a you question. Yeah, right? that's a me question. Um, that's based on time, right? So normally, what we've been doing with some virtual events now, uh, we're actually doing a bunch of pre-records. Um, if it's an hour of virtual studio time, um, or sorry, if you have an hour presentation we need to allot two hours of recording with a tech remotely. And then if you want to get into more edits, then that's, that's you know, the sky's the limit there. We can, we can do tons of edits or a lot of people are just doing it in one take, you know, to, to meet a budget number. So it helps that way. So really there's no like hard and fast, but a good rule of thumb is if your presentation's an hour and you want to do it live, um, where we can do like your presentation, a picture in picture in you with a nice background that you've seen in the graphics here. Um, that would be about two hours of recording time and then we'll we'll go from there. Excellent. And I will take the one more. Do we have any tips to give speakers on how to pre-record at home, their camera angle lighting, things like this? <laughs> You want me to take that or do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, well, you know what? We will actually, uh, to whomever that is, we are actually working on some tips around that, you know, basically thing, best, best, uh, best practices. There's and some easy things I can, yeah. Exactly. Well, I was just about to say, we'll be working with Mainline AV to, to, to get that over to you. But um, the biggest thing I would say is, is lighting. Lighting is huge first. Um, make sure they're not in front of a window, simple things, make sure they're not in front of a window and you at least have all your light sources coming from either side of you in the front. If you can start there, that's that's huge. That'll make that'll make a world of difference. Yep. Or you could just be in a dungeon like me with just a couple of lights on. <laughs> yeah. Excellent, guys. Well, listen, uh, that's going to wrap up today's show. I want to thank our guests, Eric from Mainline AV and Mr. Tommy Brott from Interactiva Moten. I will pronounce that right one day, I promise. <laughs> Um, if you're looking to produce a live stream with the same level of quality and awesomeness that you see today, feel free to reach out to Eric at ericmiller at mainlineav.com. If you're looking for some help with producing better event content, particularly for virtual events, reach out to Tommy at Tommy at interactivamoten.se. Uh, we will be sending uh, those contact, that contact information out after the webinar. And last but not least, if you're looking for an awesome way to deliver your stream, event content, engage your audience, and more, reach out to us, uh, sal at meetappevent.com or info at meetappevent.com, and we will uh, we'll get you started. Uh, for those of you that may have missed on some of today's live stream or just couldn't make it at all, have no fear. Uh, we will be posting this recording in the next few days. Till then, thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you next month.